Hey there, I am Dakota Layden. I am the director, editor, and producer of Destination Fear, Trail to Terror. This is so awesome! I know nothing about these locations. I just know that we're driving east. <laughs> Trail to Terror, it is a documentary, but it also is a challenge. It's a total experiment. I think if you're going to capture real fear on camera, this is the way to do it. We're going to be at huge, scary places, sleeping in separate rooms, super far apart. I've always liked fear. I love the idea of fear. Fear is cool. Okay, relax, 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 relax. What the heck was that? This is a bad idea. It's really scary. Oh my god. I can't move, I'm so scared. Hello, I'm Sonia Winesett, and this is an episode of Filmmaker Focus. Today we're interviewing Dakota Layden, director, editor, producer, and star of the documentary Destination Fear, Trail to Terror. The documentary follows Dakota, his sister Chelsea, and best friends Tanner and Colin on a five-night journey to the most haunted locations in America. What starts out as an experiment in fear becomes a real-life horror movie. Hi, Dakota. Thanks for joining us. Hey, hey, thanks for having me. Trail to Terror is your first ever documentary. What was the experience like from a filmmaker's perspective? To be honest, when I made Trail to Terror, it was a total passion project. I, I had no expectations. I raised the money myself. At the end of the day, if it didn't turn out to be good or entertaining, I was just going to upload it to YouTube as a free video for people to watch. And I think that was important, though, in a way, because I wasn't disappointed when nothing happened right away with it. And then years later, when something did happen with it, um, it was amazing. So how did you get into the paranormal space? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, my whole life, I've, I've definitely been a filmmaker from a very early age. Uh, one of, I was one of the very first people on YouTube making sketches. And that was my passion in middle school and high school. But one of my other passions was urban exploring and the paranormal. I had had some stuff happening in my neighborhood and in my house growing up, some pretty intense stuff, actually, with the paranormal. And that kind of sparked an interest right away at a young age. Some of the people in the documentary, my sister Tanner and Alex, who's in the TV show Destination Fear now, we would go and urban explore abandoned buildings in Minnesota, where we all grew up. And that was honestly like a big hobby of ours in high school. When some people are going out partying and having fun, we would go to the creepy, spooky places. And the whole goal, too, it was to try and experience the paranormal. But the main goal really was adrenaline rushes. We wanted to go get scared and put ourselves in scary situations. And honestly, it was just such a natural start that eventually one day the idea was kind of birthed to like, let's combine my two favorite things, filmmaking and the paranormal, and do a documentary. And that's what happened. And for the Challenger experiment it's itself, you know, the, the four of you like going to stay at these really haunted places for five nights in a row. So what was the initial spark for the for the challenge or experiment and how, you know, did that turn into a film? Yeah, you know, I was working in Atlanta as a production assistant on some movies and I met Colin, who's in the documentary. And right away we, we, we hit it off. We had a great relationship and we shared a, the paranormal. We both were very interested and when we were on that movie set, it wrapped. We went on a little trip together. Uh, There's like a celebration of it being over. And that whole trip, we were talking about doing something like a documentary. And every day, a new thing was added. And, and basically, it slowly became this experiment where we're going to go to five places in one road trip. And it'll be continuous, only five nights. And no one's going to know where they're going, only me. And we should all draw out of a hat and sleep alone every night, too. And it kind of like turned into like, a little mini paranormal meets survival show slash experiment. And that was it. And then literally a month later, I raised the money myself and we were filming it. 
And what is it about capturing fear on camera that intrigues you? Back when I used to watch paranormal shows and, and study them, they that's what always captivated me the most. It wasn't even necessarily what they were capturing. It was like the human psyche side of it and how they're reacting. And whenever someone got, got scared on TV, I would get scared. And I don't know, I just wanted to really try and do my best to capture fear. And with both the documentary and the show that we're doing now, Destination Fear, that's always been kind of the the driver for me is how do we how can we implement new things so that our fear level is constantly raised? Why did you select uh, Chelsea, Tanner, and Colin to do this challenge with you? Yeah, you know, Chelsea and Tanner, um, you know, she's my sister, Chelsea is, and Tanner's basically my brother. He, he's been friends with my family before I was even born. And we've always done urban exploring together. And so it, it definitely made sense to have, I had to have them because this was something we grew up doing together. I definitely trust my brother, but I also think that he picked some pretty scary places because he doesn't go half-ass on stuff. He knows where our limits are and he knows how far he can push us. And he knows he can go past it because, <laughs> like, what am I going to do, do disown anything. him as exactly. a sister? I can't do that. Exactly. That's why he wanted me. <laughs> <laughs> this sucks. This makes sense now. <sighs> And then Colin, obviously, as he's a filmmaker. I met him along the way in my career as a filmmaker. And then one day we met up and we had this shared common bond. So Dakota hasn't told me really anything about what we're doing. I kind of like it that way because it doesn't give me time to think about like, oh, I'm about to go to this really terrible place. Colin, I wanted in it and on it, but I also really wanted his skill set as a director of photography. He did a lot of the, the shooting for me and helped me a lot along the way. So how did you initially think that each would handle the challenge versus what actually happened during filming? I mean, think of it as expectation versus the reality. Yeah, I, you know, it's so wild. I, I just didn't know what to expect because before leaving on this road trip, I had done all the interviews. I had combined all the research and the packets of information per each location. And so I, I knew how intense it could be based off of other people's experiences. I didn't necessarily think it would get to be as intense as it was. Um, I'm not going to spoil anything, but I definitely thought we would all make it to the end. And I didn't think there would be anyone quitting. And I was, def I was wrong about that. To be honest, this was, in a way, it was kind of a selfish experiment even for me to be like, what is going to happen at these places? Well, well, this is happening. This is real. I have not prepared mentally for this at all. I <laughs> started reading the Bible a lot more. <laughs> I'm not even kidding you. When stuff started happening, when stuff started pushing us to our limits and testing us, I was not prepared. And as the leader of the group taking us into this, that's probably something I should have been more prepared for. So at the top of the film, you're all excited to get on the road and get to the first location. Like, how long was it before that initial excitement turned into apprehension? So every night we would sleep alone. And it was that first night of sleeping alone. We had all explored the building, had some really, really bizarre encounters. But then we separated, and that's something you just can't prepare for. Turn the lower foot steps again. Make someone's brain outside. That was when it really set in. And I think by night three of five was when our breaking point happened, when we really realized like, I, I can't see the finish line anymore. I don't know if we're gonna make it through this. Because uh, by then you're like, not only dealing with uh, inhospitable <laughs> location, but like the sleep deprivation uh, must've been like playing with you guys as well. 
I mean, exactly. Like it, it was a five day shoot and every location was five to eight hours apart in different states. And so for me personally, I probably averaged maybe an hour of sleep every day for five days straight. I 100% was dealing with sleep deprivation. That even brought up like psychological challenges where by the last couple of nights, I just felt off. I thought I was seeing things, but I knew I wasn't. Like your brain just really starts playing tricks on you when you're that tired. But luckily we had cameras to know whether, is this real? Am I experiencing this? And then some of the stuff I definitely was experiencing. And what went into the selection process for each of the locations? Was there a list of criteria that you were following, you know, um, in determining like, hey, which five haunted locations are we going to go to? Yeah, you know, I think... When we used to go urban exploring, me, Tanner, and Chelsea, we would, uh, asylums and hospitals were the ones that scared us the most, and they still do to this day. So I wanted to make sure to have a healthy balance of asylums and hospitals and those types of locations. And then I also wanted it to get dramatically worse. I wanted everyone to start on the easiest, on paper, the easiest night and slowly get worse and worse and worse. We are in for a treat. We're gonna go step in the RV and tell them where they're going for the night. I'm not ready for this. All right, so Tanner, you're gonna open. So here goes uh, night number one. Boom, boom, boom. Ashmore Estates. <laughs> I still don't know what that is. That's what it looks like. The first two locations, Ashmore Estates and Randolph County Infirmary, were county poor farms. Can you explain what that is, county poor farms, and why so many seem to have paranormal activity? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of reasons people um, could be sent to something like a county poor farm. Sometimes it was for mental illnesses, if you couldn't take care of yourself. Most of the time, though, it was for people who were suffering um, a lot of especially during wartime where the the husbands would go off and never come back and the family was back here with no money. And so these these homes were meant for people like that to take care of them. Uh, the poor farm actually was started um, by the state and what it would have would be indigent people or people that um, were divorced or had a disability or learning disability. Basically, the poor farms were built outside of town for the simple reason that they didn't want the residents of the poor farm to actually intermingle with the town's people. The conditions of the poor farm were basically, it was a working environment, almost like it was they were in jail. I mean, the, the people that here were actually called inmates. You have to remember this was the 50s and 60s in mental health, and uh, they were trying a lot of strange stuff, you know, lobotomies and and electroshock and and, uh, being out here in the boonies, who knows what went on. There's a lot of really tragic and sad stories, a lot of death. A lot of the times these places were overflowed with people, um, a lot of the times too, and they would pass away. They they didn't have proper burials. They They didn't know who to contact, who these people's families were, so they would bury them on the site. And all that trauma, all that history, that definitely is a perfect concoction for a a paranormal hotspot. Why did you decide to split up and sleep alone in different areas of the location? Yeah, you know, when creating the idea, we wanted to amplify fear in as many ways as we possibly could. Just one month ago, the abandoned facility was open to the public. There have already been claims of seeing black shadow people, humanoid apparitions, hearing unexplainable voices, and clothes being tucked. I'm not really looking forward to the separated night sleeping. Yeah, it's gonna suck. That was something we had never even attempted before doing this documentary. And for me, that was the perfect experiment. Like we're gonna be here for 11 to 13 hours. Let's do five or six of those as a group, get our bearings. But for the last half, let's separate and sleep alone.
this jail cell here, uh, third floor by myself. This is definitely uh, a step up from last night. I am in a cage here, people. All right, guys, so I got the first floor hallway. Kind of freaked out a little bit. Well, in the basement, it's time to go to bed. Somehow. I'm about to go to bed. I'm on the basement floor, the second hallway. This sucks so bad. Good night. Night, dude. <laughs> this sucks ass. There is a theory in the paranormal world that fear amplifies the paranormal, that the paranormal feeds off of fear. And so for us, it was like, what better way to give off fear than by being alone? And then also, too, it kind of gave everyone their own unique opportunity to have a personal interaction with the location. Now you're not with the group. Now you're by yourself for multiple hours, and it's a challenge. Can you describe from, um, from your own personal experience what it was like? Oh, it's just, it's, it's still scary to this day. It's so unsettling. Like, you shut your eyes for one second and you start to picture a girl in a bloody dress standing over you. And you go to the worst places when you're separated and sleeping alone. Oh God, holy crap. It's by far the most uncomfortable thing I've ever done and continue to do. Time goes by slow. You, you're you counting the minutes and it, those three to four hours feel like eight. Behind me is the, the room where four people took their lives. There's just this long hallway just down this way and then this. Oh, how are you supposed to sleep? This is the worst part of like this entire documentary. Sleeping alone by yourself in a haunted place is it's just terrible. You're also tired. It's it's the last half of the night. And so this is usually between like two and seven AM. And so like those are the core hours of just you're tired, you're scared. And um when something happens, if you hear something, if you think you see something, feel something, it's twenty times scarier than being with the group because you have no one with you, you have no protection, you have to run or scream to get someone to help you. Were there any skeptics going in? You know, it's funny. Um, our beliefs in the paranormal amplified a lot after doing this. We did a little thing in the RV when we first took off from Minnesota, our hometown, and we just kind of did a round table filming each other. Like, what do you think about ghosts? What do you think about the paranormal? I definitely believe in spirits. I definitely believe in uh, demons and angels. I don't know. 
I just hope there's no like satanic rituals that have been at this place because that's going to be the goofed up part. There's negative energies in the world. <laughs> and so I think that demons exist. And I think a lot of times what a lot of people think are ghosts are demons just playing with people. We all were like, we believe, we believe that there's demons, we believe that there's there's stuff out there, but I don't know, for us it was like, why though? Like why some of these buildings, why does it stuck in a specific building? And I think we believed, but we weren't full on, like we didn't expect much to happen. And then literally by the end of the trip, we were like the whole drive home, it was just like a, a bonfire conversation where we're just, everyone's rambling like, holy crap, could you believe this? And, Turned us into more believers for sure. Once you see things, experience things in a small, close-knit group of friends where you know no one's overreacting, no one's not telling you the truth. By the end, I became a firm believer and it, it definitely made me want to even continue this, this type of stuff more. By the third night, Chelsea pretty much starts to fall apart. Um, what do you think got to her? You know, yeah, night number three, we... We had had a rough trip, but at this moment we were all together and we heard what sounded like a little girl crying. Someone's talking upstairs, third floor. The third freaking floor. It was just one of those unbelievable, like you don't even, you can't even wrap your mind around it moments where we know there's not a three-year-old girl in there. This is an abandoned hospital. If there is a three-year-old girl in there, that's even more messed up. Why is there a girl here? Chelsea's the only girl in the group and we heard a girl voice. So I think for her, it really hit home. It was, it was the first, up until this point, we'd heard bangs, loud noises, crashes, even like audible, like mumbling. And, and stuff, but this was in your face. This felt like someone was maybe 10 feet in front of us. Hey, I've like never heard a voice before like that in my life. Are you okay, that was really scary. <laughs> also, too, I will say like even though we heard a little girl, maybe this was us overreacting or overthinking, but we all got the interpretation and the impression that this was evil. Like this wasn't a little girl. This was something else. We, the, it, there was something so much darker that we were feeling at the moment. And Chelsea wanted to be done right then and there. Tanner wanted to be done. Like we almost ended it on night three. And I think Chelsea she showed it maybe more than everyone else, but everyone was feeling the same. <laughs> All right, hey, 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 deep breath real quick, okay? It's okay. We need to just go right. downstairs. Deep breath. Go downstairs. Deep deep breath. Deep breath. That was a legitimate voice. That was a voice. That was a little Let's freaking back voice. Hey, guys, guys. Let's just go. I need everyone just to relax. Okay? Just down the stairs. Just follow me. I know where I'm going. Okay. I'm freaking, we're done. So that night, Chelsea refuses to sleep alone, and you guys split up into teams of two. Um, why did you change the rules? You know, I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> they pretty much forced my hand. Uh, the, they basically told me, we're either doing sleeping in twos or we're done. And like, it, as a friend, I, Chelsea had already cried. She's my sister. That was never the goal. I did not want to see my sister crying. That was like, that even, that hurt me too, like seeing that. And I think at that point I was just like, this isn't, this is an experiment. We are trying to push fear, but at the same time, like if they're ready to tap out by night three, I know the next two nights are only going to get way worse. And I'm going to give them this one right now. 
I'm seriously like so freaking like. I'm, I'm not, not sleeping alone. Like I'm gonna either quit alone. tonight or I'm not sleeping alone. You guys I'm can decide doubles. if you want me we'll on here. Do if you guys want me here, I'm that. not. I'm not sleeping alone tonight. And I honestly, I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I probably was okay with it. Like the second they said let's sleep in two, I don't think there was much fighting on my half either. I think I was just like, let's do it. Yeah, that's a great idea. Outside St. Albans, you hear um, Native American chanting followed by what sounded like a Civil War reenactment. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that that is, I think, the most overlooked like thing in the whole entire documentary. Cameras weren't even rolling. We were getting our sleeping bags from the RV and just kind of gathering up to go do the hat draw to sleep alone. And all of a sudden, I can hear Chelsea and Tanner running towards the RV. So I, they're saying, like, Turn on the cameras, turn on the cameras. What, 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 what? It's like an Indian champ. Where? Out here. What? Go, 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 go. Turn on the camera. The interesting thing is where the sanatorium is, in front of it is a hill that goes down several hundred yards to a river. And on the other side is the city of Radford, Virginia. And there was a civil war battle on that property. There also was a massacre of Native Americans on that property before the Civil War, and it all took place between the river. And we were hearing distinct, as if there was a reenactment going on, Native American type chanting. At one point, it even sounded like horses, hooves hitting the ground. And then the end of it was men screaming as if they're in a war. And it even sounded like they're saying, attack, attack. It sounded like the horses at first. And all of a sudden, you could hear him go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So me and Chelsea heard Indians way down there. Then we ran and got Colin and Dakota, and they heard it too. There's some weird things going on it's on this lame. ground. Dude, even outside is creepy. Oh, my God. <laughs> If I'm looking at it from a realistic point of view, I'd say it's like a recreation because they're, the Indians are known to have been here. But it also, at the same time, it's three, it's three in the morning on uh, Tuesday. Radford, Virginia is not a big city. And this was at three in the morning on a Tuesday. No one knew we were there. And the only thing, the only thing that made sense was a reenactment, but where it was coming from was a river. And why would there be a reenactment going on at three in the morning? And I just, it just made, it really was one of those mind bending, like, what did we just experience? I even called the owner of that location after I'm like, you know, what is Radford like? Do, do they have, they do a lot of reenactments with the Civil War stuff? She's like, no, there's not really a lot of reenactments here or anything like that. I'm like, what about like at night? Like, any, do you ever hear that outside the property? She's like, oh yeah, we've had people say they've heard stuff like that. I'm like, wow, okay, creepy. All the hairs on my arms just went up. <laughs> So at St. Albans Sanitarium, um, something in the bowling alley got to both of you. Um, could you expand on that? Yeah, so St. Albans is honestly so creepy. The hallways are so narrow. It's got three floors above ground, two floors below ground. And on that second basement, there's a bowling alley. And the bowling alley, it, it's just you are as deep down and as far as you can get from an exit when you're in that bowling alley. And there's said to be, people call it the goat man or red eyes. And there's this demonic evil creature there. The scariest thing that happened to me at St. Albans was down in the bowling alley. Clear as day, I heard something brush on the floor and a hiss. I think that's the most active place at St. Albans. P.S. Watch out for red eyes and goat man. 
I looked up to the second floor of the stairs at, there was just two little red eyes sitting there. So next thing you know, I seen it step down on the stairs and it started stepping down, coming towards me. As you guys and gals come in here tonight, I hope you don't run up on the goat man. He has the legs of a man, but when you get to his head, it's definitely the head of a goat. And if you give him reason, he'll hurt you. We were down there once as a group, and we heard something rushing at us. If it was an animal, it had to be bigger than a human, so we would have seen it. And terrified me as when we were in a group setting. But then, yeah, later, Chelsea, she actually slept down there, and she experienced the exact same thing all by herself. hear the rumbling once again something comes rushing at her and that was officially the breaking point for Chelsea that's the night before she was ready to quit this was the night where she's like tapped out do you think she regrets not finishing the challenge I think she does um just because she's so competitive I think she knows like now years later looking back I think she knows like dang I could have done that like I should have done that but I don't blame her like she, the thing about what we do is with the sleeping alone, when we sleep alone, it's not like we just say like, you sleep there, you sleep there. Like we draw out of a hat. So it's left up to fate. And I will say like, she got the most unlucky on, on this trip. She kind of was drawing either the worst or second worst spot every single night. And after this night, night four, what she experienced down in that bowling alley. I literally heard it twice. Okay, let's, 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 let's get out of here. No, let's go. Okay, come on. I hate come all on. of this. I'm sorry. Just come on. Yeah, let's grab your camera. Turn it off. I'm done with this. I'm keeping it up. Just in case something happens again, let's just go. Oh, I literally am done. I'm done with this. I think for her, it makes sense. But I, I do think she regrets it now, just talking to her. She definitely feels like, dang, I could have done it. And how did the group dynamics change after Chelsea left? It, it definitely changed. It was so weird. Like, it just, that wasn't my goal. Like, I, I can't even stress that enough. Like, I, I never once thought we wouldn't get through it. And to have her cry like that multiple times, quit, have to book her a flight home, it hit me really, really hard. All right, I'm going to give you a hug. Love you, Chelsea. Yeah. Good luck. Damn. Yeah. Damn. Tanner had to cheer me up. Colin had to cheer me up. And it's just hard. I don't like seeing my sister cry. Uh, I like seeing her challenge to put through a rough experiment. But man, I feel like the bad guy now because that only happened because of me. I think Dakota's pretty bummed out, dude. I don't know, ever since Chelsea's gone, he's been kind of just a little bit more quiet. I don't know. As goofy it is saying this now, it's like it's good for the film. You know she's gonna be all right. She's she's safe. She's back home now. Yeah. I mean, it's just like I'm looking at this footage and I'm like, I did that to her. I yeah. put that. I put her through that. I put her on the back burner for the night, and you know then we can call her up tomorrow. Let's uh, let's do this. Let's oh. do it. <laughs> and I really wanted to get through this with everyone and get to the finish line together so that we could all look back and talk about this and. Um, it was tough. It was tough. But I think ultimately it did make us stronger in a way as brother and sisters doing this, challenging each other. And uh, 
but yeah, going into that last night, especially at the location we picked, I picked for last was the the biggest, baddest one I could find. And to have one less person, now it's just three of us going in here. It made it even more scary too. So uh, let's talk about Pennhurst State Hospital next. Um, can you tell us what you, Tanner, and Colin experienced there? Mm -hmm. So I think Pennhurst is truthfully one of the most tragic and sad locations in the country. What they did to some of the patients there, the types of treatments these people and, and oftentimes kids received, it's unreal. It's something you wouldn't even understand or realize happened in America and not even that long ago. And so right away, just getting there, we all ex we all were pretty emotional. Chelsea had just quit. But we, we got there and we were asking questions. We'd already had a few experiences that were weird, but there was one point of the night where we were like chasing what sounded like a little kid or a woman or young woman crying. Right in the hallway. What is that? I can't hear it. That's a real deal, dude. I can't even. Guys, there is something like crying or something it's really bad. Let me get ready to over here where I'm at. No, stop, stop, stop. We gotta hear what it is. I've heard animals before, like a fox. This wasn't a fox screaming. And I think the thing that, that made it the most real to me was that we were on the third floor of one of the bigger buildings and we would hear it from one end of the floor, go to that side, right where it came from, start listening. And then it would come from the opposite end, right where we just came from. We were chasing this thing. It was almost like something was toying with us. And it was the first time, it's the only time for me personally that I was both terrified but beyond sad. I actually, I started crying. I started bawling my eyes out because it felt like I was hearing a patient crying from the abuse that they had received. You okay? Dude, I was really scared. I was like a little kid screaming. It sounds like a kid. It was like a little kid screaming. I felt like I was witnessing something I shouldn't or hearing something I shouldn't. And there was nothing I could do about it. We were chasing it, but every time we went to it, it wasn't there. And those are two emotions I didn't even think went together. Because usually when you're scared, sad is the last thing that comes to your, your brain. And I was feeling both of them equally. And man, it hit me hard. It hit me really hard. So at the end of that night, the three of you hug it out. What were you feeling at that moment? I had such a sense of relief. I mean, I don't, on top of the, the paranormal side and, and taking on this challenge and completing it, that felt amazing, like just being done with that. But the honestly, the filmmaking side of it, it was four people in an RV. We had all this film equipment that I rented and we had to get home at a certain time. Like nothing could go wrong or else it wouldn't have been made. And to get to that point where we were finishing and wrapping and nothing had gone wrong. We didn't miss any days. Nothing. We didn't get any hiccups in the RV or road delays. It just felt so good knowing we did it. We made it through five days. We freaking did it. Let's just be done. Sure. Tanner, freaking give me a hug. Dude. Yeah. Man, give me a hug. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
This is good. Yeah, come here, brother. That's hey. awesome. Oh, that was literally the worst week of my life. Yeah, me too. Knowing too at that moment, like what we did experience, my expectations were blown away at that moment. Not only did we finish this, but I thinking about this and what we just filmed, like, I think this is gonna be really good. Like this is gonna be really fun to watch. And like, this is crazy what we just tried to accomplish. So post filming, um, was there a general consensus on what the worst part uh, about participating in this uh, experiment was? Yeah, I think even to this day, like it's sleeping alone uh, or any part of being alone. Only because when you go to these places, you build up such a false sense of security for those first couple hours. You're with everyone. You're you're not comfortable, but you have you're just you're you have three other people, and so you feel good. But then all of a sudden, it just gets thrown at you that you got to go sleep alone. And I think for us, it doesn't even matter the location. Just being by ourselves was terrifying. What was that? For some people, they could say that even just in general, being by yourself to your thoughts is a scary thing and throw in a haunted building. Whew. Of the five locations, which would you visit again and why? You know, I actually, I can say today that I have been to every single one again. Um, I think my favorite location though we, is Penhurst. Penrose is the type of location I still dream about. I have like this weird feeling every time I think about it that I just want to go back. I just want to be on the property, be on the grounds, and not even for a, a scared sense or a paranormal sense. We have a TV show now, Destination Fear, which is from the, the documentary, based off the documentary. And we did go back to Penhurst and I just feel like that's a story I want to make sure people know. I want to make sure people understand, like, this is what we did not that long ago to treat people with mental health issues or, or mental disorders. And you can go to a prison, you can go to a poor farm, and those are very sad. But when you go to a place like Penhurst, it just sticks with you. And then on top of it, the paranormal stuff we experienced was next level. It's coming from the other side of the building now. Dude, it's everywhere. It's coming. We, we came over here. Yeah, that's a location I feel like I, I just want to be at all the time and experience. And every time I talk to someone who's maybe never looked into the paranormal, I've talked about on locations. Penhurst is the, one of the first locations I will tell them about. And usually people get interested. And, they, and a lot of times people don't even under, realize that, that that happened in this country. So is anyone suffering any residual trauma from, uh, from this experience? I will say, this is actually kind of sad, but the, the, from doing the documentary and now the show Destination Fear, we have slept in over 50 something buildings now. And I have developed insomnia. I don't sleep anymore. I have nights where I'm okay, but to be honest, like, it's hard for me to fall asleep before 5 a.m. now. And a lot of times I get up at like 8.30 or 9. And then nightmares as well. I think a lot of us have nightmares all the time from this where you would wake up in your bed and like you'd almost have like a lucid dream where you feel like you're seeing the hallways of an abandoned building or an asylum and you feel like you're sleeping in one of these buildings again until you snap out of it. And then I know for like Chelsea and Tanner and me it's too like, noises i think we're unless we're like just in a great mood but if like i'll be at the house even today and a plastic bottle will pop because the pressure in it you know is off and i jump and gets i'm way more on edge than i used to be i feel like talk about occupational hazards <laughs> right <laughs> Um, if you were to shoot trail to terror 2 how would you up the stakes I have a couple ideas. Trail to Terror was five nights in a row at five of the most haunted places in the country. But what if we did seven nights in a row at one of the most haunted places? So instead of hitting the road and traveling, we're stuck in this building. And, and a lot of these asylums have multiple buildings. So what if you're actually stuck in your own personal building for seven days and you can't leave? That's kind of maybe the idea to amp it up a little bit more instead of getting a break on the road between days driving. It's like, no, there's no more breaks. In the daytime, you're still in the abandoned building. That sounds horrifying. I know, that's down. why I haven't done it. It's, it's, 
it might not ever happen. <laughs> As a filmmaker, is it difficult wearing multiple hats on a project, specifically being behind and in front of the camera? Definitely. It's funny because I never really liked being in front of the camera. My passion has been behind the camera. I love editing, I love writing, I love directing. Redo, cut. So now I'm on camera and it does feel weird. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I miss out on is being in front of the camera. You can do so much before the role to try to get things set as what you like. All of a sudden you're the one on camera and you do the whole, you film for whatever the amount of time it takes and you don't get to review the footage till I'm editing. And like, there are definitely times where I'm like, man, I wish I wish I had a clone so I could have been cam mopping me talking or I don't know. There's definitely a lot of challenges, even not even being in front of the camera, but being the person behind the camera. There's always challenges, especially when you're dealing with bigger productions for bigger now discovery plus and everything. It's always tough. You want it to be the best. And sometimes, especially in a road trip setting, things happen all the time where you just can't plan for them. But I have learned, honestly, like doing the show now, Destination Fear, that Sometimes the best things in a in a type of project like this, which is just a raw kind of guerrilla filmmaking vibe, is just to have a plan, like have pit stops planned out for the road trip, things that would be fun to go see. But if it doesn't work out, roll with it. Like we had an episode where our RV broke down and we were on our way to go do something really awesome that I was super excited to do. But we just said like, let's just, let's roll with this. Like, let's have fun with this. We were stuck at a truck stop for like six hours and all of a sudden, you know, we filmed it all. And when I got to editing, I made it in the cut. And it's one of my favorite parts now because it's just so genuine to a road trip. And so, yeah, I don't know. It was a long answer. No, that was great. So last question. Are you interested in exploring stories or subjects outside the paranormal space? Definitely. I mean, I, I feel like, honestly, like I love the paranormal, but I love filmmaking so much more. Like I eat, breathe, and that's all I do is filmmaking. I just love it so much. And the filmmaking and paranormal mixture kind of happened randomly. Like there, there were two passions that got blended. Um, but definitely, I don't. I've been writing a lot. Um, the last two and a half years, I've been doing the show and I've been editing the show too. I edit over half of every episode, so a lot of my time is eaten up. But pretty much every Saturday at least Saturday, sometimes even Sunday, I'm writing um, screenplays. And I think, you know, my roots, my favorite thing is comedy, dark comedy, um, even horror comedy. Um, and so I've been writing a lot of that. I have a couple screenplays done. Nothing that I'm trying to even sell right now. I'm just trying to get better as a writer. Um, but I could definitely see when the show ends, if it, whenever this ends and whenever we come to a stop with the paranormal, that'll definitely be my next move is move into more directing, writing, um, I just love that so much. I study movies every day. I, I try to read a couple scripts every week and that's definitely where I'm headed, I think. Thanks so much for coming on, Dakota. It was great really digging into, you know, all the nuances of this documentary, Trail to Terror. Yes, thanks so much for having me. This was a blast to talk about and I hope anyone out there listening or watching can feel somewhat inspired because yeah, this was this was a total passion project. I did it for nothing, no money, and it turned into something that I just so beyond me that I never thought would happen. But it, all it started with was a little bit of passion, honestly, and just enough of a drive to get it done.